Thanks. So Carlos, you're moderating, are you? Yeah, I will be moderating. I will be hosting okay. you. I'm very happy to do that as well. No, good, great, yeah. Look, I haven't, um, it's not like a scientific talk, I hope, because I haven't really prepared anything for that, but it'll really just be oh, a talk. No. Yeah, we're going to talk, we're going to take it easy, and we're going to have a time. You'll see. Cool. Great. Well, I'll mute, I, I'll mute my, um, my signal, so I'll let you go on as... As, uh, as, as long as you're ready, Carlos. Thank you very much. Welcome, Dr. Kylie. Thank you. Dr. Kylie, how are you? Good, thank you, Carlos. I'm so glad to have you here. Welcome to the Cannabis Mexico Summit. Yeah, thank you. I wish I could be there in person. Yeah, I know. Uh, due to circumstances out of our power, you cannot be here. Otherwise, we would have <laughs> flown you here ourselves <laughs> but um uh, please i am very interested in, in your background i i googled you a little bit yep how, how how does one transition from being a physician to going to chinese medicine please tell me well what was that all about how, how did you do that i uh, was originally an optometrist and okay. uh i was a pediatric optometrist i used to work with kids with learning difficulties I used to run eye camps in India for uh, people who couldn't afford glasses and cataract surgery. But uh, there was something missing there and I wanted to help people more with their, their health. So I went back to study a master in public health and then uh, halfway through that did a degree in Chinese medicine and realised that that was actually where my heart lay. So I did my PhD in Ch uh, Chinese medicine later on. I worked for the government to implement um, regulation of Chinese medicine. So we were the first state in a Western country to regulate the profession of Chinese medicine back in 2000. And 2012, it became a nationally regulated, uh, medic uh, Chinese medicine was a, a nationally regulated profession via statutory regulation. So I, uh, I got into a, a lot of the, the, the aspects of Chinese medicine, not just education, which I started working in universities and developing master's degree programs in that. But as I said, I worked with the government to implement the Chinese Medicine Act. Yeah. Research. So um, that sort of transitioned me into the world of, of Chinese medicine from, as I said, optometry, which is a, a, a bit of a weird segue, I guess. Yeah, a little bit, but but it's very interesting. I mean, you you must have found something really interesting that piqued your interest to go in that direction, no? Yeah, yeah. Look, my father had a, a condition at the time. I took him to a Chinese medico in Melbourne, and I realised that even though he didn't speak any Chinese and I didn't uh, he didn't speak any English, sorry, and I didn't speak any Chinese at the time, I could sort of understand what he was doing. Um, so it was, it was uh, interesting and that was enough for me to start to explore Chinese medicine, realise that it is a very comprehensive medical system in its own right and that's what led me to, to want to um, practice a medicine uh, that was, um, it's very comprehensive, it's very uh, specific, so um, it's not vague in any way. Uh, it's very scientifically based as well. Um, so I ticked all the boxes, but I wanted a form of natural medicine because I just, for me, um, I wasn't so enamoured with the, the drug model of modern uh, medicine. Great. Awesome. I like, I love that answer. Um, if Oscar can help us with the next slide. I would love to know about this. It's the first time I hear it, honestly, but please, would you please yeah. tell us about the... the International College of Cannabis Medicine. Okay, so look, we're just about to launch the International College of Canna um, Cannabinoid Medicine, actually. Um, it's the ICCM. So um, it'll launch on the 27th of April. Now, we are, I've been involved in cannabis education in Australia for the last three years. I wasn't involved in the cannabis industry before then. I was more involved in the integrative medicine um, field, so educating doctors about nutritional and environmental medicine. But when um, uh, cannabis became legally accessible for medical use back in 2016, a colleague of mine came to me and said, look, you know, it's now available to be prescribed by doctors only. 
but um, there's, there's really not much in education, so there's not many doctors prescribing it. Can you help? So I set up some of the first courses that were accredited by the Royal Australasian College of GPs. Uh, there were two day face-to-face -face courses uh, on how to prescribe cannabis on the evidence base of cannabis for a range of different conditions. And, uh, and so they ran quite happily. Then COVID hit, of course, last year. And then I changed uh, where I was working and started to work with a, a different group. And I worked more in the cannabis industry itself. And with the group that I'm with at the moment, we decided to set up uh, an online platform for education. So we have 30 minute videos on a range of different conditions. So we can start with, you know, what is the endocannabinoid system? What is medicinal cannabis? But then I've got a range of clinicians and academics from around the globe who are contributing on different topics. So we might have a, a, a talk on chronic pain. We might have one on uh, anxiety. So we've got a bank of at least 30 videos already and we will be adding three or four each month as I start to gather uh, more speakers who are interested in cont contributing to this. So it'll be a kind of a subscription model, if you like. So healthcare, it's it, this is for healthcare practitioners. It's not for the public because it is pitched at that, that level um, necessary for, for, some, for um, healthcare practitioners. But people will be able to download um, or, or stream individual videos. They might be able to stream a course if they liked, or they can actually subscribe to the website and have access uh, you know, on a yearly subscription fee. So we want to make it as, as accessible um, as possible, but it is very evidence-based and we have a, a very great um, high quality group of speakers that are a part of this. Awesome. So um, the purpose, the purpose of, of the college is mainly educational. No, it's not just education, it's research only. So I've got a background in clinical research as well. Okay. So the ICCM will also be um, sort of entering to the clinical research space as well. So it'll be a vehicle for research too. But the first thing I wanted to get off the ground was the, the education. Okay, great. Um, I imagine that, that you will have to base your research only in countries that specifically allow the research, right? I mean, the, the specifically the laws mandate that, uh, that research can be made in this sort of substances. Oh, of course. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, I mean, Australia does a lot of research in the natural medicine space. And even though we don't count uh, medicinal cannabis in the natural medicine space in this country, um, you know, we've got a, a very good system for, for doing research in Australia, but, we, you know, uh, it, it's possible for us to be working in other countries as well. So that's the idea of having, you know, the International College of Cannabinoid Medicine is that who we partner with and where we partner can be all over the globe. But you're right, it has to be in countries that um, allow medical research into cannabis. Do you guys already have uh, certain protocols you would like to start with the research? Yeah, uh, we have, but uh, I can't sort of share those publicly at the moment. <laughs> but certainly, yeah, yeah. So once we get it underway, I'll be shouting it from the rooftop, Carla. So, you know, I'm really passionate about research, and I just sort of think that um, it's the way to help mainstream it into healthcare. Um, I, th I think that, you know, we need that. And there's many different types of, of research. It's not just randomised controlled trials that are the, the be all and end all. There's other types of research that are important too. Okay, and, and here in Mexico, how can we help with the ICCM? How, how can we be of service? We love the idea of research as well. Well, I think um, there's a, a, lot, a lot that we can actually sort of do. And, and I mean, you know, part of what I do is that I, I write research protocols uh, for clinical trials, for example. So there may be possibilities to, you know, sort of partner over in Mexico or on research and share our knowledge. I'm very much about working together in teams um, rather than trying to do it all. And I think if we all hold hands and try and work on this and bring the best brains together, um, then, then we're going to do really well, I think. Yeah, perfectly, perfectly well put. Um, how about, uh, it's, I know it's a big question. I know that it's a little bit off topic, but <laughs> what about United States? You know, like, like what do you need to do research in, in a country where it's only state legal and not federal legal? 
Look, I'm probably not the right person to talk on that topic simply because I don't live in the US and I've never done any research in the US. I certainly do have some colleagues who are researchers and I know that one colleague in particular had some problems um, getting hold of the actual government stash of um, bugs to be able to use in her clinical study. So I don't know really um, what the issues are from state to state. Obviously, there's 34 states in the US at the moment that allow medical use. So presumably the other states, it would be more difficult perhaps to do research there. But I'm, I'm probably not the right person to ask about no. that. Yeah, no, no, no. I asked that question specifically because it's very obvious that, that what you're looking for is countries in which the federal law it, it allows this kind of research. Oh, yes. right? <clears throat> That's right. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know uh, if if we could pass to the next slide. Uh, I I would like to to know what got you motivated in, in working on, on mental health research. Yeah. Look, I I think it was really uh, through running the educational events. Um, that uh, and when you look into the literature, you see time and time again, what are the top reasons people are using medicinal cannabis? Well, it's chronic pain, it's anxiety, depression, PTSD. And I suppose in some ways I got sick of people saying, oh yeah, but there's no evidence for that. Well, yes, there is, but maybe you haven't read it. Now I wrote a book about three years ago, it was published in the US on integrative oncology for the same reason. I got sick of people saying, oh, there's no evidence for that. So I wrote a book on integrative oncology, which um, was really about well, what should you be talking about in a, a, a consultation with patients and why should you be doing that and put the evidence behind that. So I took the same approach. I wrote a book um, on medicinal cannabis and mental health with my colleague, Dr. Philip Blair from the US, who I met um, over a year ago now. Um, and we looked at um, six different clinical conditions under the mental health banner and really took the approach of saying, well, look, what do we know about the pathogenesis, the pathomechanisms of each of these conditions, just in general? Um, what do we know about how the endocannabinoid system is involved? So what's, what's the evidence that the endocannabinoid system is involved in these particular conditions? And now what's the evidence that cannabidiol, tetrahydrocannabinol and some of the terpenes may be efficacious in um, treating these different conditions. So again, it was pulling together the scientific literature into, um, into a book. So it's not as if I went out and did all the research myself. Um, these, these are all animal model studies. These are all human studies, a range of different studies, epidemiological research, controlled trials, et cetera, et cetera, where we wanted to pull together, well, what is the evidence and where are we at right now? So that was kind of the reason I got into looking at mental health, simply because a lot of people are using it. And um, I wanted to sort of, I guess, get, uh, get a message out there that, look, you know, evidence is not perfect uh, and we need more research, but there's, there is research already. And, and, and to explain what that was, I guess. Great. Um, so you mentioned six particular pathologies. Could you elaborate a little bit on what pathologies yeah, are, are yeah. those that, that you're studying and, and, and specifically a little bit, um, what are the grounds of the study of each one of them? Yeah, I guess um, the topics that we looked at in the book were anxiety, depression, PTSD, sleep disorders, we focused on insomnia for that, dementia, and we focused on Alzheimer's for that one, and um, autism spectrum disorder. So for each of those, you would, you know, I'd say in general, there's certainly a lot of evidence from animal models for, for each of those. So there's a massive amount of, of studies in animal models where we actually start to understand well, what's the potential um, role of the endocannabinoid system so is it disrupted or dysregulated in some way and if, if, if so what's happening with it um, and then with um, I guess the the research side of things for example there's probably more research um, evidence in terms of randomized controlled trials in anxiety disorder compared to depression for example 
So, and, and I'd say in general, there's a lot more acute studies, which means that they've dosed people and seen what happens straight afterwards. So for example, in, in anxiety research, they'll often use a simulated public speaking test as a, a, an anxiety producing um, exercise, a bit like now. And, um, and then they'll, they'll dose people with um, CBD, it might be 300 milligram of CBD versus a placebo. Um, and they'll see, do they perform better, you know, on a, on a range of variables. Uh, so that's what I call acute dosing, because they're seeing what happens sort of straight away. What I think it seems to be missing across the board in, in all these areas is what happens with more chronic dosing. So to actually be looking at clinical studies where people have been using it for a longer time period, not just a quick look, let's look at what happens immediately afterwards. So there's varying amount of, of evidence for, for each of these um, areas that we've looked at um, with cannabidiol in particular. And I think that's just, it's just reflective of the state of play of research at the moment, that it has been difficult for people to be able to get to do research because of prohibition um, up until more recent times. Israel's probably more ahead of the game because they've had um, better opportunities, I think, to do clinical research as well as animal research. So I think that's sort of part of the issue. Um, we're, we're at a point where more research is happening now. It's going to grow. But at the moment, I'd say in general, the, the, the clinical research is more limited. Um, it's better in some areas than others. So um, what kind of opportunities are you searching for to, to be able to do this research? Would you like, uh, like what the, are the legal conditions that you're looking for in a country for, for people to, to be able to participate in, those, in these kind of studies? Yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, my particular interest is in cannabidiol. I think it's got, it's got some advantages in that not only is it a, a, a very interesting, I'm talking about cannabidiol cultivars, so um, hemp-based um, hemp cultivars, yeah. so high in CBD, very low in THC. Um, a lot of the issues, certainly in Australia, um, in terms of, of research, is that THC, it's illegal to drive with any amount of THC in your body in Australia. So it's going to make um, recruiting for clinical studies actually a little bit difficult because um, that would be one of the risks that a, a participant in a study would run is that they might get pulled over for a random drug test. So I don't think it's ideal, um, our regulations here at the moment. CBD is not the issue, it's, it's THC in terms of the police and, and drug laws. So okay. let, me, let me get a little bit of topic. I'm curious yeah. about the, the logistics. How, how, if you're driving on the street in Australia, they can pull you over and they can determine that you have THC on your body. Do, do they do a, a urine test right on the spot or how no, does that work? Just be a, a, a saliva test, a swab test, I guess. Oh, great. Um, yeah, but our driving laws, we don't allow a recreational use in our country except for one state, which is the Australian Capital Territory, legalised the use of recreational um, cannabis um, last year. So every other state not. So, you know, recreational use is still illegal. So, uh, but our driving laws, even though they're state-based, across the board, um, it's still illegal to have any amount of THC. It doesn't matter whether you're impaired or not. That's not the issue. If you've got any amount, then you are, you know, liable to, to, for prosecution. So, so it's yeah. a problem. So you're basing specifically your studies on cannabidol, specifically because of these mandates that you have in Australia, right? And you cannot do research with THC in particular. And, and so since you're Australia based, hmm. you are basing your research from Australia outwards to the world, I guess, no? Yeah, look, you know, we'll do our own research here in Australia. So I've got a couple of projects that are about to sort of um, kick off fairly soon. Um, but and, and they are in CBD, so CBD, um, full spectrum, but CBD products. Um, I'm not interested personally in doing any research on isolates because I, I think that as a herbalist myself, it's the herb, it's the whole plant that works, not an isolate. So, um, but, you know, there are 
I guess, opportunities with the right partners to work in other countries and work as teams. So, you know, as I said, that's part of, of what um, I will be doing in the future. Um, I'm, uh, as I said, I collaborate with um, some of my US colleagues as well. Um, but, you know, you can run uh, things in other countries as long as you've got people on the ground in those countries who are basically the clinical study coordinators. So yes. it's about bringing the best, as I said, international minds together. And it doesn't necessarily mean you all have to be physically located in that country together. Awesome. Uh, let me jump to the next question. I think we already talked a little bit about the next question. Yeah. But um, what are the challenges in Australia? I, I mean, you already mentioned a few of them, but yeah. you're Australia-based. Uh, I, I don't know if, if it was hard to start the institute for instance or or yeah uh, the purpose of the institute was it uh, a convoluted subject between your peers etc no i mean um i guess starting our, our our institute up was you know something we just we did there was no issue with that the problem with regulations uh in australia around medicinal cannabis are that I think it's probably regulated in the wrong way. That's my personal view on it. In Australia, medicinal cannabis is called or um, no, it, it's it's seen as an unapproved good by our government regulator. So it's not an approved good. It's allowed into the country, and there are strict quality control mechanisms that companies have to jump through to bring a product onto the market. And I actually think that's a good thing. I think that's what Australia does well is its quality control of medicines and natural medicines. But the problem with calling it an unapproved good means that uh, firstly, um, doctors have to go through uh, a complicated prescribing route to be able to prescribe it. They can't just write a prescription out. So um, cannabidiol, for the most part, is a Schedule Four medicine in this country, which means it's a prescription-only medicine. Anything with THC or less than 98% of CBD is a Schedule Eight medicine. It's a controlled substance. Now, because of that, it means that only doctors can prescribe it, so naturopaths can't prescribe it, um, herbalists, um, Chinese medicos can't prescribe it, and you can't just go down to your health food shop and buy some CBD oil yourself. So it has to be prescribed for a start. Now, there are two um, regulatory um, schemes that the doctor can go through. They can go through what's called the special access scheme, which means every time a patient comes into their office, they have to jump onto the government online portal and they have to fill in a form which seeks approval from the Therapeutic Goods Administration to be able to prescribe for that patient. Now, if that um, product is a Schedule 8 medicine, they also have to get permission from the State Health Department. Now, up until uh, it was a separate process, now it is one online form, so at least they're doing that right. But um, you know, that, that approval might come through within an hour, it might come through within, you know, one to two days. So it's not immediate. So the patient then can't walk out with a prescription and then go to the pharmacy to have it filled. So that's one issue. And that's one mechanism. The other way is that doctors can become authorised prescribers. Now, an authorised prescriber means that they have had an application assessed to prescribe specific products for specific conditions. And it's a two-step process. So they have to apply to an ethics committee. And, and if the ethics committee say uh, approve them, then that letter is, they have to then send that letter to the Therapeutic Goods Administration who then assess it and make the final judgment. Can Dr. X prescribe these cannabis products for these conditions? Now, it's a lot of paperwork up front. Um, the problem two years ago was that there were no ethics committees doing this. And I happened to be chairing one of the ethics committees at the National Institute of Integrative Medicine at the time. And so I set up that um, institute um, ethics committee's processes to be able to process um, a, a authorised prescriber applications. So it's now been running quite well for the last <clears throat> two years, but that's probably one of the few ethics committees I know that's actually doing this in Australia. So 
That might seem easy. So that means if you're an authorised prescriber for, say, chronic pain, it means every time a patient comes in with chronic pain, you don't have to then jump onto the TGA online portal and seek permission. But if you prescribe a Schedule 8 product, something with THC in it, you've still got to ask permission from your health department. So it's still, you've still got more paperwork. So it's, you know, it, we've, been, we've had it legalised medically since 2016. Why is it still an unapproved good? We're you know, five years down the track. Hello? Goods um, Association about access, and I can tell you a little bit about those if you if you're interested. By all means, please. So last year, um, I actually put in an application on behalf of a number of different um, industry uh, companies to change the scheduling of CBD. So we applied to the, the scheduling committee to take it off the schedules totally and regulate it like any other herbal medicine, like a complementary medicine. And Australia's got an excellent system for regulating herbal medicines and, and other complementary medicines. But the TGA put in their own application to their own scheduling committee against our application. And they, um, their application was to down schedule CBD uh, as long as it had under a an amount of CBD per day to a pharmacy only medicine. So that's what we call schedule three. That means that a person who um, could go into the pharmacy and basically the pharmacist could have a consultation with them and then recommend, you know, a CBD product. Now that one was the one that won out. My application didn't get up. Their own application to themselves did. Um, no surprises, I guess, there. But the problem was um, they ha um, it's 150 milligram per day. And um, to see only um, schedule. See only medicine At the moment. We don't have, we've got the ability to put some. To be able to get any of their products onto that schedule just yet. So it's going to be you know, um, not until perhaps next year that we start to see some CBD products on that pharmacy only um, schedule. So that's kind of where things are at with CBD products at the moment. Um, I would still argue that they still should be regulated as a complementary medicine, as a herbal medicine, because, hey, they're a herb. That's my personal opinion on that. Of course, yeah, I completely understand. Believe me, here in Mexico, we know a bit about paperwork. And about... Yes, yes. <laughs> I don't think we've got the ideal um, set up, to be honest. I wouldn't um, suggest that you copy our model here because I actually don't think it's, it's, a, it's a great model myself. I think what we do here really well is the quality control of medicines. And um, I think that's, that's a good model to look at. But I think in terms of um, prescriber access, I don't think it's a good model. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if we could jump to the next question, please, Oscar. Oh. I think that was the three questions, Carlos. Uh, well, those were the three questions. I'm so sorry. I thought that it was a little bit longer. Uh, usually, all the other uh, doctors that I that I have interviewed today, they have okay. at least, uh, yeah, they have at least seven questions around there. But, That's okay. But Kylie, um, is there something you'd like to add? Are you hiring? Are you looking for for physicians with certain requirements for for work? Um, what what does it take to participate to work in the ICCM? Yeah, look at the moment. What I'm very interested in is um, looking for partners who may be interested in in partnering with with us with, in the education, and that might be by utilizing our our resources or helping promote our resources. Um, to other doctors. I mean, my, my goal really is to, to, um, to help educate as many healthcare practitioners as we can. So there may be groups that would be interested in partnering with the ICCM in terms of being able to, you know, help distribute this. There are others that might want to contribute by being one of our speakers and, and actually speaking on, on some of their topics that they're passionate about and, and um, creating some of the videos with us. 
So I guess there's, there's a few opportunities there. Um, certainly with research, if there are groups out there looking for um, people to partner with in research and help them develop their clinical trial protocols um, and being part of a sort of a, a, a team, as I said, um, to work together, um, sure, give me a call. I'd be more than happy to, to talk to people about um, those opportunities. At the end of the day, my passion is about educating, is about providing the evidence and getting access out to people um, you know, in, in every way that we can, because I actually have found that this is the most fascinating herbal medicine that I've ever come across. It has captured me like no other Chinese herb um, had in our sort of regular Materia Medica, and, and cannabis indeed has a long history um, of use in China as well as many parts of the world. So, um, yeah, as I said, open to, uh, to any sorts of conversations on those lines. Great, and um, you mentioned a lot uh, the research that, that you did. Well, you wrote the book on mental health, but yeah. is there is there any other uh, particular pathologies that you're looking for and doing research? I know that the, yeah. I'm trying to be discreet. I, I don't want to spoil the beans here, but uh, just a little bit on what, when I look at what's necessary and, and what ideas keep popping up. Yeah, you know, I, I gave a talk, for example, uh, 18 months ago at one of the hospitals on endometriosis for a support group. The nurses wanted to know about it because a lot of their patients have, were, were accessing it illegally. Now, I think that's a fascinating area to be looking at, endometriosis in terms of symptom control, but also you never know what happens with the actual pathogenesis when you start to sort of look at more longer-term studies. But I think certainly symptom control would be a great um, one to be looking at in, in endometriosis. That's one that comes straight to mind. It's chronic pain. It affects a massive amount of women um, and there's no great answers for it. So I think, you know, things like that, I think are, are excellent ones. I think anxiety is another one where we need um, more research in sort of the, the mental health space. Um, and uh, I'm not a paediatrician, but I think there's a lot of merit in um, research in autism spectrum disorder because, um, you know, I've certainly seen anecdotal um, reports of it working well in kids. That's not my area of research or, or necessarily interest, but I think that one's got a lot of merit as well. So I think there's just sort of some of the ideas that I think um, you really need to choose the, the, the um, I guess, problems that are common um, and start to build up the evidence base of those, but also neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease, where we don't have answers for. And yet we know, again, anecdotally, that it works um, you know, quite well with a lot of people. I've seen um, patients with Parkinson's do very well on it. Um, and I just sort of think, given what we understand about the endocannabinoid system and how cannabis seems to be able to work, um, then any of those neurological conditions, I think, um, are really well worth looking into um, as well. So they'd be some of the ones that I'd be very interested uh, in because I think, you know, if you can help people with such dreadful conditions, um, then you're really doing a great service to humanity. And um, I would like to ask, is there space in the ICCM for other sciences, non-medical sciences about research for the plant? meaning specifically a little bit of agronomy about, uh, about how growing the better, yeah. best crop? Yeah, I look, I, I absolutely think so. We started on the medical stuff because that's my sort of, uh, I guess, area of, of um, interest and, and expertise. Um, but simply, um, yes, I think we will definitely expand. And I think it's really interesting to understand how the plants are grown. I'm starting to learn more about it myself. Um, how they're cultivated, how the growing conditions actually affect the, you know, the profile of the, the plant. Also to understand the manufacturing process. I think that's really useful for, for a lot of people just to understand, well, how, how do you get from here to here? Um, so, yes, I think we will be building out that section as well. I think I just really wanted to start and get something great off the ground that was going to be useful for doctors because doctors are worried, you know, the stigma, they're worried about, well, is there any evidence? Yes, there is evidence, and it, it may not be perfect evidence, but there is evidence on a range of conditions. Have a look at it. It's growing all the time. Okay, and um, finally, 
from my end, uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, for starters, uh, could you share with us your, your website? How can we locate you? Yeah, sure. So in uh, on the 27th of April, it will be www.iccm.co. So um, you won't be able to get onto it at the moment because I've kept it shut until we're ready to launch at iccm.co. Um, and uh, yeah, happy, I mean, if, if people, if you want to contact me personally, you can uh, email me at Kylie, K Y L I E, at Relief Clinics, R E L A E A F Clinics with an S dot com dot AU. So I'm more than happy for people to contact me directly, um, and you'll be able to contact me through the ICCM when that launches too. And finally, I I know that we already spoke about this, but, but Mauricio is asking. Um, about your, your pediatric experience? Like, have you introduced uh, certain cannabinoids to, to your medical practice towards uh, children? And if so, what, what have you found? What is the research? Um, yeah, are you no, looking forward to work with stuff? You know? Yeah, look, um, I'd say that um, the, the doctors that I work with, um, there's a few in Australia that uh, are pediatricians with an interest in cannabis. Um, or GPs with an interest in children's health and cannabis. I'm not one of one of them, and I'm not allowed to prescribe anyway. I'm a Chinese medico, so um, only Western medical doctors and some nurse practitioners are allowed to prescribe um, in a, in in Australia. So I know that there are a couple of people that who have got an interest in pediatrics, um, but uh, that's about it. So I think they're fairly thin on the ground in Australia, um, but that's not to say that there isn't some great research happening uh, and that certainly there's a fairly strong body of research in the epilepsy space um, you know, around the use of CBD. So there's plenty to read there. I certainly haven't written anything myself on um, paediatrics uh, because it's, it's probably really not my area of, of expertise. So I'll be upfront about that. <laughs> Besides taking your courses, is there a recommendation you would give to physicians listening to us uh, on, on how to get rid of the stigma and how to start working with cannabinoids? And, and you know, I, I know that it's directly dependent on, on the research, and I know that it's yeah. directly depending on the education that you have, That's the right. safety that you have with what you've learned, but uh, do you have any... Look, I, I just think when you look at the evidence base, and that's what doctors will look at, I think if you can um, upskill yourself by understanding this scientific evidence base as well as understanding these safety aspects, um, then you're going to feel a lot more confident about prescribing it. You're going to learn, you know, the, the doctors that work in our clinics, for example, tell me how much they learn from their patients as well. So it's a patient's experience um, that, that teaches them a lot about medicinal cannabis and I know that a lot of our physicians have found it personally um, very rewarding that they're being able to help people with it but you know uh, as I said um, you do as doctors and healthcare practitioners you are always wanting to understand how does it work uh, and is there evidence of efficacy and what are the safety considerations and that's really just about getting yourself well educated you have anything else to add? I am so glad that you that you were able to to make the time to speak with us. Honestly, yeah, no problem. Um, I don't know. I'm looking forward to, on seeing you again and and start working with you and show you a little bit of, of our projects and research and stuff. Fantastic. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to to working with you too, Carlos. And, I, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. As I said, it's very exciting um, what's happening in Mexico. I'm really um, happy for you guys that things are starting to really move ahead and good on your government for making that happen. Yeah, we're glad as well. We, we are ecstatic and, and a little bit um, too good to be true, you know, like uh, it's almost it's, it's almost too perfect. We're very happy about it and, and we're very happy to be able to host uh, such a wide variety of professionals like yourself, experts on so many subjects. And, and, and we're very proud that you were able to make it and to share a little bit of your time with us. 
Yeah, no, my, my pleasure. And as I said, hopefully when the world stops, you know, going mad, we might be able to sort of uh, land in the same country together. And, um, you know, I'd love to do some, some education stuff over there as well. It'd be fantastic. Awesome. As we say in Mexico, uh, aquí está tu casa. Whenever you want to come. Thank you're you. more than welcome to be here and, and we appreciate a lot the, the, the time that you took to, to speak with us. Yeah, no problem. All right. Well, thank you again and um, good luck with the rest of, of, of your conference and I, I'm sure we'll be in touch. As I said, anyone who wants to, uh, to contact me, you're very, very welcome. Bye, Kylie. It was very, very nice talking to you. Okay.